Hi, I'm Jen, and it's been nice to meet the people that I've met already this morning and look forward to meeting other people as well as the day goes on. I'm a clinical psychologist by training, um, and I'm based in Hawthorne GP Medical Centre. So I run an infant parent mental health service there. Um, and the idea is that we're kind of based there in the, the GP surgery to try and reduce stigma and increase accessibility and in kind of overcome some of those health inequalities that prevent um, families being able to access care and support in that period. So I would I love chatting on, like Emily loves chatting about the GP deprivation training program. I love chatting about that. So if people want to talk about that in the day, come find me. I'd, I'd love to have a, a good crack about it. Um, what I'm here to talk about today is a model that I find helpful in my clinical work with families. But I also find it useful in my relationship with colleagues and in terms of thinking about organisational stuff as well. And that's the compassionate mind training um, model. So I'm sharing that with the hope that it might be of use to people, whatever their role is within healthcare. Um, because we know compassion really matters. And we've heard about that this morning already. People have been talking with, with huge compassion. Um, and I guess, you know, this is what the NHS was built on, isn't it? And healthcare is built on this value of offering compassion. And we know, unfortunately, when it's not around, um, that often, and things go really badly wrong, when we unpick it, we can see that a lack of compassion has had an impact on the patients who might be accessing the care, but also on the staff working in systems that have been stripped of compassion. And also, it costs more money as well. So on all levels... We know, you know this, we're talking to a room of people who know this, that compassion matters. And that's why we've had people like John Ballot, Pam Camplin, writing for over decades about the importance and the, the cleverness, the intelligence of having like, compassion and kindness in, in healthcare. But more recently, what we've seen is some research that's looked at how, why does it make a difference? And we heard just in the panel about kind of how you're talking about kind of within primary care, real active compassion making a difference. But how does it? What are the mechanisms that make that difference? So that second bullet point up there, I hope I say this right, Trzekiak, I think, and Mazzarelli, they did a review where they pulled together different research to look at how does it make a difference to the people who were coming in to, to, to access care. And they found 20 different mechanisms. So they talked about how the practical stuff can be different. So if um, people are engaged in compassionate care, then we know that actually there's much less likely to be serious medical errors because the quality of care is, uh, is increased. We also know physiologically it makes a huge difference. So they found that when compassion was involved in care, patients reported lower levels of pain in terms of their immune responses. If they had things like a common cold, it was likely that the symptoms would be less severe and they would last less long. Things like stress-mediated diseases, they found that... Um, sugar kind of there was optimal kind of levels for diabetes as well when there was compassion in the care they found these kind of pulling together this research to show how it's really having an impact and relationally as well there's some evidence that the mechanisms work and that if compassion is there in the interactions that we have with people then actually the patients are more likely to adhere to treatment plans and there also I get, there is evidence that actually it's better for practitioners as well that there's less burnout when we operate in a compassionate way. So these are kind of all the things that you know as a room of healthcare workers. It matters, compassion, obviously. But I'm using the word because it is used quite frequently, but what do we mean by it? So this model that I want to just introduce and it'll hopefully be of some use to you um, uses the definition that's provided by the Dalai Lama here. So I've got a picture of him on there. And it talks about having a sensitivity to the suffering of self and others with a deep commitment to try to relieve it. So often when people talk about compassion, there can be a little bit like, oh, that's a fluffy or easy thing to do, or there might be a bit of eye rolling. But actually, compassion is really hard to do. To actually turn towards the suffering instead of turn away, take something, and to try and do something about it. Now, you do this on a day-to-day -day basis, don't you? Um, but it's no wonder that we're knackered. <laughs> we're really tired because after a day, it's not just about the long shift. It costs something to do it as well. You know, we have to draw on something in doing that as well. It feeds us, it nourishes, it's rewarding, but also it's not an easy thing to do. So that's an important thing for us to remember, I guess, when we're thinking about this. The other important thing to remember about is that we're wired for it as well in terms of compassion. 
So if we can do a bit of like audience participation. Um, so when a baby's born, what do they need in order to survive? Just shout out anything. Milk, fantastic, thank you. Anything else, what might they need? Warmth, did someone say? Oh, anything else, fantastic, that's good. Protection, yeah? And how do they get all of those things? Milk, warmth, protection. Yeah, from another. When we're born, like unlike other animals, where you see they're born, nature documentaries, a couple of hours later they might be running around, that's not us, that's not how we come into the world. We are designed to connect with another, that's how we survive. Um, and it's, that's true not just of us as individuals, that's kind of true as humankind. We're reliant on each other and we've kind of been sold this thing that we're all competitive, but actually we're designed to connect, we are designed to live in communities. And if we think about the climate crisis, you know, as the last quote on there says, love and compassion are necessities, they're not luxuries. Um, so that's, I guess, what we're thinking about when we're thinking about compassion. Obviously, lots of definitions around, around compassion, but there's also a bit of um, neuropsychology that Paul Gilbert, who designed the Compassionate Mind Training Model, um, he, he draws on a lot of um, neuropsychology as well as some evolutionary theory. And there's three main points that it might be worth us hanging on to today. Um, so it might seem quite basic, but the first point is about us having the capacity to experience really strong emotions. So we might feel those emotions in our bodies, and we might talk about gut responses or our heart responding, but there's also an awful lot going on in our mind when we're feeling these emotions. So you can see here we've got an image of a neuroscientist, Rebecca Sachs, and she took a, bit, a picture of her kissing her baby in an MRI machine. This took a long time to achieve, by the way. Um, and you'll see she's overlaid on it the bits of the brain that fire up when we're trying to figure out what is going on in another person's brain. So when we're trying to connect with someone. And this is the, re this is the second really important thing. is Because our brains are wired to connect to each other, when somebody, for example, like stubs a toe, we might get that like, ooh, kind of response in us. Or when we see like a kid hug another kid or offer them comfort, we might get that, oh, kind of response as well. That's what we're designed to do. You know, that's part of what our brains are, are trying to do and make sense of what's going on. So that's the second important point for us to remember, which might be useful for thinking about this model. And then the third point I think that's important to hang on to is um, this idea that we have the capacity to experience strong emotions, not just because of what is happening now, but because of things we can remember as well. So, you know, if we've had a big row with somebody, when we think about it, we might get the same sort of like, oh, I'm still wound up about that. And we kind of get that same bodily response that we did. Or if we remember something scary, we can get palpitations. Um, I'm just going to flip back. Or, or, or happy things as well. So that can have a real impact on us. Um, so they're the important things to remember. So Paul Gilbert, who kind of pulled this model together, he said in order for us to kind of make sense of this, so because we've got all this complex stuff going on in our minds, we've developed these different emotion regulation systems to help us manage them. So he talks about the threat system, the drive system, and the soothing system. So the threat system is that system that has come into being to keep us safe basically it is on high alert it is looking for danger everywhere so it operates on a better safe than sorry principle so if we think about our ancestors and we think about where there might have been a rustle in the bushes much better to think okay i think that's probably a predator rather than it's the wind so that kind of neural pathway system gives us a hit of cortisol and it makes us ready to fight or flight yeah, we're going to have a fight, we're going to run away, we might freeze. So we've got that emotional regulation system within us. We also have the drive system, the blue one. And that one is about um, seeking resources in order to survive as well. So that's about going out and getting things. And that's accompanied, when we've done that, we get a sense of achievement. And that's accompanied by dopamine which is quite a nice thing to get a hit of. And so you can kind of get really into that and you can go into overdrive. I get a lovely dopamine hit when I've been food shopping and I open my fridge and it's full. That's the thing that I get, yes, that's, that feels good. 
So we've got the drive system there. And then we've also got the soothing system. Now this is when the threat system is not in action, so there's no danger. We've got everything we need, so the drive system's not trying to function. We just really soothed, calm, okay, connected. And hormones like oxytocin are kind of associated with that system as well. Is that, I know I've whizzed through that, and so it's a lot of talking, but is that making sense? Do shout if I'm just talking nonsense and you want to ask a question or anything. Um, so they're the systems that are going on for us. Now the idea with these is that our different experiences exercise these different neural kind of emotional regulation systems to a different level. Okay? I'm obviously not talking quick enough. Go back. Um, yeah, they, they exercise our systems to a different level. So a bit like walking a path through grass, the more you walk it, the flatter that grass becomes, the easier it is to walk. So these systems become quicker to trigger the more experience you have of those systems being triggered, if that makes sense. So what do, society wise, which systems do you think we exercise most? Drive. Drive. Yeah, lovely. There's a lot of stuff, isn't there? If we think about advertising and how that functions, do this, do this, and you might be happy. If you have this, you'll be successful. If you do this, yeah, wonderful. Any other systems that you think we might exercise? Yeah, red threat as well, yeah. And we can see that if we look at kind of media coverage of things, there's a lot of threat, isn't there? There's a lot of reporting of threat and there's a lot there, yeah. And nobody really said soothe, which is interesting. It feels like there's something that we've kind of lost or are missing, not everywhere, but it's harder to see that more broadly. Now, if we think about this in the context of health inequalities, what would we say is being developed for people who were struggling against all sorts of stuff there. Red, yeah, yeah, threat is high, it's high. And I think, I guess thinking about my infant parent work, I think about the Embrace support, which looks at maternity outcomes, and that is just staggering in, in terms of the differences depending on where people live, less affluent areas, if they have, they're kind of growing up experiencing systemic racism, other inequalities, much harder to have positive outcomes. So threat can be really high. So let us think, get a little bit more audience participation because we're nearly at the break. I want to keep you with us. So if we think about a hypothetical patient, I'm going to ask you what you think their systems will look like. So this is Kaylee. She's a 19-year-old woman. And she, her dad lost his job when she was a kid. And then the family started to struggle financially. Conflict grew between parents. And then violence escalated. And her dad ended up being sent to prison for a serious physical assault against mum. Mum struggled to care for her, and there were issues of addiction, and she was taken into care when she's 12. She often got into trouble at school, and, the ki and in the kids' home as well, for like lashing out and running away. This sounds something recognisable to people? Yeah, okay. Currently, she's struggling to manage money, and she moves between friends' houses as well. So what do you think her emotional regulation systems would look like? If we think about one being more exercising, the other, which one do we think might be exercised most? Threat. Yeah, absolutely. So threat is large. So just as Laura was saying about going into a healthcare setting, being a place that can trigger threat, let's imagine Kaylee's coming into some sort of healthcare appointment and she goes in and there's already a queue at reception. What do you think might be going on for her there? Spot on. Spot on. Already, yeah, already she's feeling unseen, that she's not going to matter, there's a queue. She waits in the queue, she gets to the desk, and the phone has been ringing, and the poor receptionist is on her own, and, and she's been trying to do it all, and she goes to reach the phone. What do you think Kayla might do in that moment if she just got to the front? Yeah, yeah. Hit out, and was there something else? Or leave, yeah? Fight or flight. Kick off or leave. Because your, your threat is so high, why wouldn't you do that? That is what has been exercised, that is what you do. Absolutely. So now let's think then about if we have a hypothetical healthcare worker. Let's think about what their systems might look like. So let's say we've got Mariam, first person in her family to go to higher education. Family very proud. She did really well at school. When she got to further study, that was much harder, but she was really determined she was going to stick at this because she really wanted to have a job that would make a difference. She's always been known as the caring one in her family and friendship groups, and she works for really long hours in this role. 
um, as well as continuing to care for others outside in her personal life as well. I don't know if there's some recognition in the room there, there's some smiles on faces going, hmm. Um, but what do you think Mariam's systems might look like? Which ones have been exercised? Love it. I love that. Sometimes that gets missed, you know. But there's something about us in offering care, we also exercise the same system. So that's the bit that's rewarding for many of us in healthcare is that actually by offering care, we, we're stimulating our own soothing system. So brilliant. Any other systems that you think might be activated? Drive. drive spot on. Yeah, drive, because we can see how that has become something. And there, again, there is a kind of a bit of a dopamine hit with this, that rush of achieving, of doing. So what do you think it's going to be like for Mariam if she's working in this healthcare practice and Kaylee's just like, no, nah, I've had it, I'm out of here, or is kicking off? What, what might get triggered for her? Threat. Threat, yeah, absolutely. And this is where we go back to those underlying principles about how our brains are so interconnected with other people's and they're powerful. We read what's going on for each other, we feel it, we experience it. So what the compassionate mind training model might suggest is that if we're able to spot that in action, and you'll know this, but if we're able to spot that in action, we might be able to intervene in some way. So if, if we see, if we can visualize, okay, this is someone in threat, that might actually help stop our own threat system being triggered because it's so quick. Like our amygdalas are designed to pick up on threat really quickly. But if we have a model where we can understand what's going on in theory, maybe we can do something a bit different. And maybe we can exercise and grow our own soothing systems as well. It takes practice, though. You know, it takes a long time to kind of walk down those paths of grass and make them more easy to access in the moment. But there's some references at the end with links to the website where you can kind of access different exercises that do, do they do just that. Um, and the idea being that if we become more soothed in the moment, which I think we heard examples of in the panel, then other people will feel more soothed in our presence as well. And also, I guess, the compassionate mind training gives us a scope to think about what that could look organize, like organisationally. So this was, um, what, what, I think you said it, Laura, moments of change. And this is from Karen Treesman's work on trauma-informed practice, that every moment and interaction can be an intervention. And I absolutely agree. I think it was Ian, we were doing the shout out to the receptionist. I absolutely agree that that's just so key. You know, time and time again, I've seen people come in in high levels of distress. And by the time they get to the healthcare practitioner sat in the room, they've been soothed by amazing reception staff. They'll say, oh man, it's been such a long wait. I'm so sorry. Would you just give me a moment? Because I really want to hear you properly. So if I answer the phone now, I'll be able to pay attention. And, and they've done this soothing before they get in. That's every moment that you have the opportunity to do that. And it is a whole kind of team thing. And we've got the evidence to show that if we're able to do that within interactions, it really does make a difference. So Trzeciak has a TED talk called 40 Seconds of Compassion. Um, and they looked at it, it was in oncology care, they did this research. And they found that if they had 40 seconds of compassion, a little bit at the beginning, a little bit at the end, they had much better outcomes in terms of well-being for, for patients. So if we just have a look at this and think about what you could do or probably do do already in relation to these words, I'd just like to share how much of a difference this is actually making, really. We know this makes a massive difference. So in this example, the words they used were, I know it's a tough experience to go through. I want you to know I'm here with you. Some of the things I say to you today may be difficult to understand, so I want you to feel comfortable stopping me if I say something's confusing or doesn't make sense. We're here together, and we'll go through it together. So there's something about the togetherness. There's something about saying you can ask me questions, and there's something about recognising that people, it is hard for them to be there. If we're able to do that, it will make a real difference in terms of our patients that we're kind of working with as well. And finishing with that at the end of the interaction. So 40 seconds that can make such a big difference. So I guess that's one thing that we can all remember that we may well be doing already, um, but just hanging on to the fact that we're doing that and it makes a difference is good. But just as we've kind of also talked about, we can't do that unless we looked after ourselves. Raja, you were saying about the importance of self-care and I think that's so key. 
if we think about stress as being symbolized by water here, and if we pretend this top bowl is the patient coming in and they're spilling over with the stress of life, and we as a practitioner might try and catch that, in that we're the middle bowl here, um, and we're trying to catch that. But if we're too full, we'll just spill over. So we need bigger bowls to be able to tip out. And I guess that's worth us thinking about who are our bigger bowls within the organisations where we work, where do we do the tipping out so that we can then contain the stress of, of, of the lives that is coming in towards us as well. So that's a question that we might want to think about a little bit more in our own settings. And then finally, last slide, um, thinking about um, organisationally, we can do the stuff we can do individually, but if we think as an organisation, it can have so much power. So this was written about in the Harvard Business Review, and there was a failing healthcare organisation system in Michigan, it was in America, and the CEO decided he was going to do di things differently. He said to people, okay, I want you as staff, I want you to um, bring your heart to work, and make heartfelt connections. So I want you to say who you are, what you're doing, but also a heartfelt why. So the example here is, I'm Tom, I'm here to change your dressings because we want you to get home in, terms of in, in time for your granddaughter's wedding. And it was that bit at the end that made the difference. It's like, I see you person, which we've already mentioned about, and I care about you, and I want this to be different. And what they did, they did role plays, to have a go at doing it and then they had a go at doing it and then they celebrated when they saw their colleagues making heartfelt connections and they had little red hearts now i'm not sure how this will translate from britain from america to britain we might have to rethink how we do this but something about spotting that in action really made a difference gorgeous examples in the paper of like a nurse where a man was was kind of kicking off in reception and security had been called and the nurse had just done a role play and she'd kind of walked up and she went do you want a hug and, and it, like, he was like, yeah. And sort of when really upsetting, his wife had just had this really horrendous diagnosis, but she, she was able to hold him. They didn't need security. And that all stepped back. Another lovely one of the reception is changing what she said from being, um, you need to come back in two weeks to the doctors would like to invite you to come back in two weeks. Tiny little wording, but it just made people feel valued. Um, and that made a real difference. So they saw scores improved, it says there, on-call light responses, pain management, discharge planning as well. So satisfaction rates went up, clinical benefits went up, all from kind of those heartfelt connections. So I um, know I'm definitely preaching to the converted here and this is what people are doing, but I guess it's just worth remembering when we do it, it has real, real impact. And I think it'd be lovely if we could spend a bit of today celebrating that as well. Okay, thank you.